The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to the crowds, This is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and through it all the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord the land yields fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wheels the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable can we use for it? It is like mustard seed, that when it is sown in the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them, but to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A retired priest, Father Bill Bausch, from the Diocese of Rochester, New York, recounts the following story. Josephine was only a little girl when her family moved to California. She was in the third grade, and every day the bus would pick her up like it did all the other kids and drop her off. In her case, when the bus came back from school in the afternoon, her brother was waiting for her by the fence that surrounded the house. He was a year or two older than Josephine, but he didn't go to school. Some of the other students on the bus used to look for him, and when they saw him, they would laugh hysterically. They laughed at him because somehow they had recognized that he was different. He looked and acted differently from the other kids, they didn't know why, and the kids on the bus didn't understand, so they laughed. They would wave to him, and sometimes they would call, call out to him in a mocking manner, and he in turn would wave back to them, only to make them laugh all the more. But when Josephine got off the bus, her brother would jump up and run to meet her. And to see the other students surprised, Josephine didn't seem to at all embarrassed, though she knew behind her the kids on the bus were having a great time. She would greet her brother and hug him, and often she would just drop her books on the ground and throw both arms around her brother. And then hand in hand, the two of them would march into the house. Josephine was only a little girl, of course, but she had learned a very important lesson about love. And it took time, the rest of the school year, as a matter of fact, for the others to learn this lesson. But toward the end, the other students gradually seemed to understand a bit more, and their mocking behavior began to subside. Obviously, some of the students' parents had heard about this and had spoken to their children about their misbehavior. And then some of the other more perceptive children felt that somehow it was not right to be mocking this kid, and their example affected some of the others. Therefore, they began to show a little kindness and compassion. When anyone would ask Josephine about her brother, Josephine would simply say that her brother was retarded and would never be like the other kids, but he was her brother and she loved him. Later on, even a couple of the girls would come over and play at the house, and they got to know Jimmy and would play with him as well. The children on the bus would still wave at Jimmy, but this time it wasn't out of mocking. It was with a little more gentle kindness, and he would wave back. And Josephine rode that bus for many years until finally her parents moved away. But the image of those daily visits of Josephine embracing her brother and the evolving reaction of the kids on the bus remained in the memories of those students for a long time. Else you would have not heard this story, which was told to me by a now 50-year-old woman who was one of those students. So the question now is this. 
Do you suppose that the remembrance of little Josephine and her brother Jimmy in any way influenced those school children now grown to be adults to make them a tad more sensitive and compassionate? And what have they taught their children in terms of dealing with the Jimmies in their own life? And that brings us to our gospel today from Mark chapter 4. These parables about seeds can also be found somewhat in Luke 13 and Matthew chapter 13. But the quick, big question in order to appreciate these two parables about people throwing seeds in the ground is why? What's the relevance of these passages for Mark? And it boils down to this. Right out of the starting gate in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 1, the very first words out of the lips of Jesus were, Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus kept talking about the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, and when he talks about the kingdom of God in the Bible, he never describes a place or gives color or depth or size. He always talks about it in terms of a miracle he performs or most often in terms of a story that he tells, such as the parable. Now, behind the scenes, the disciples are asking some questions. First of all, when's the kingdom of God going to come? How is it going to come? How will we know that it's here? And the first story he tells, he says, it's like this person who planted this seed. And rather than sit around and watch the seed grow, nobody would do that. It would be horribly time-consuming and boring. He gets on with life. He gets up, he goes to bed. He gets up, he goes to bed. Life goes on. But while life is going on, that little seed had become a sprout, that became a stalk, that produced an ear, that had kernels in the ear. It just happened. That's what the kingdom of God is like. You don't know when, you don't know how, but you know that it's going to happen. Or in other words, the kingdom of God comes because God makes it happen. Paul will say it in another way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, when he says, you know, it's like this. I planted the seed, Apollos, my partner, watered the seed, but only God makes the seed grow. Story number two, the mustard seed. How many of you have ever grown mustard? Man, you are a bunch of city slickers. <laughs> it is a teeny tiny itsy bitsy little seed. If you take a piece of white paper and take an ink pen and make one little dot, one tiny dot, that's the size of a mustard seed, literally. But you know, it really can grow to become the size of a bush. Now you have to let it go, because when you're growing mustard seed, it's in order to get the mustard greens, which you fix with something like bacon or whatever, you know, a cardiologist's nightmare. But if you let those mustard plants go, they'll become bushes. And yes, birds of the air could nest in those bushes. Jesus says that's what the kingdom of God is like. Or in other words, it starts out incredibly small. And then something huge comes out of it. What's the point of this story for us? The story of Josephine. Josephine and Jimmy. A heartbreaking story initially. Kids can be very cruel, for sure. But look what happens. Josephine pays no attention to those mean-spirited brats. Instead, she is taking care of her brother. She loves her brother unconditionally, and she doesn't care who knows it. And guess what? Those children would come around. They would learn a lesson that many of them would pass on to their own children always treat people with respect but it started out with school and buses and two people our sister Perry St. Stephen's I just left there doing mass 
And it was interesting, when I was entering the church, always scurrying in the door, worrying that I'm going to be late. I noticed on the playground outside the church, there were a bunch of young people out there, and they all had on these green and white t-shirts. And I thought to myself, wonder where these kids came from? Who are they? No one told me ahead of time that there was anything going on special. So I got inside, and then one of the ushers says to me, Hey, Father Jim, there's going to be 42 kids from a youth group in Toledo, Ohio, here at Mass, sitting over there as a group. You might want to welcome them. And so I did. And so during the course of the sermon, I went over and asked them what they were doing here. And lo and behold, these 42 kids, along with their adult chaperones, are heading from Our Lady of Perpetual Health Parish in Toledo, Ohio, down to Williamson, West Virginia. I asked what grades they were from, what age group? Grades 7 through 12. They are giving up a week of their summer, get this, a week of their summer, to go down and help these people recover from the flooding and the winds that happened recently. They're giving up a whole week of their summer, grades 7 through 12. And you know, I told them something. I said, you know what? Yeah, you're doing a great thing. Good for you. You're going to help a lot of poor people. But you're going to do something that you're totally unaware of doing. I said, you're going to go down there. They're going to look at you and want to know where you come from. The word's going to get out that you're Catholics from Toledo, Ohio, and there's going to be a lot of people, as Donna Dransville can tell you, they're going to look at you and go, Ooh, Catholics? Catholics? Ooh, ooh. You mean that Satan let you out of the pits of hell to come to Mingo County for a week? Ooh. You see, Catholics aren't real treasured down in Mingo County, as they're not real treasured in Logan, Lincoln, Boone, and even Cabell County. Little do they know, in the good they're going to do, they're going to be planting seeds. They're going to be planting seeds. People's lives will be touched and changed by the week they're spending down there. People will really come to realize that Catholics maybe aren't all that bad. What a tremendous gift. So what about you? What kind of seed planting are you doing? What kind of things are you doing to spread the kingdom of God? You know, sometimes we make the mistaken notion that you have to have a PhD in theology. You don't. Paul, Peter, Thomas, none of the twelve did. Paul was a murderer, but he converted and would become the greatest missionary in the church's history. Surprise, surprise. God can use whomever he wants, and he's chosen plenty of scholars throughout history but he also has chosen plenty of poor common folk. Let me tell you about one. Her name is Rita Rizzo. Is anyone familiar with that name? Good Italian name. Rita Rizzo. Wow. If I had some money, I'd give you a prize for answer that, for raising your hand. Only three people the whole weekend between the two parishes knew the name of Rita Rizzo. One of them was one of the kids from Toledo, believe it or not, a 15-year-old girl. Rita Rizzo was 21 years old. She came from an impoverished family, and she felt the Lord's call to become a Catholic nun. And she did, and a pretty great one, too. She vo uh, joined uh, an order associated with the Franciscans and called the Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. Well, Sister Rizzo really prayed hard and worked hard, and eventually she would move up through the ranks of the convent, and they would go on to Alabama where they would build a convent, and of all places, the state of Alabama. Can you imagine that, a convent of nuns? Lord, help us. She was praying before the Blessed Sacrament, a reason why Eucharistic adoration is so important, you all. And all of a sudden, one day, she felt the Lord saying to her, I've got something for you to do. I've got something for you to do. And so she kept praying, and she kept praying. And something unthinkable came to her mind. 
the Lord was telling her, I want you to start a television station. Now at the time, Rita, Sister Rita, had no knowledge of television other than there's an on and off button and you sit down and you watch it when it's on. But she heard this call. So she did some reading, she consulted some people, and with $200 and a handful of sisters helping her, she founded what would become EWTN. How many of you are aware of that? Yeah. The Catholic Channel, it's called. Sister Rita became Mother Angelica of the Blessed Sacrament. Her television station is now viewed around the world. Her radio broadcasts are, view, are listened to in every country on the planet. Pretty amazing coming out of the garage of a convent in Alabama, huh? But let me tell you the impact she's had, that little seed of a nun. First of all, you all are probably aware that our RCIA classes have grown significantly. Every year we have a minimum of two dozen people in the RCIA that come to the church. This past year it was even more. When I asked the people, what brought you to the faith year after year after year, so many of them say, I happened on to Mother Angelica's channel. I was saw a, a, a program on EWTN. One guy I'll never forget, my second year here, told me that what got him was he was watching the Catholic Mass on EWTN. And he saw during the Christmas Mass all of these candles lit around the altar in the sanctuary. And he said, it just affected me, candles of all things. And so he came into this church and came to Midnight Mass with one goal in mind, to see if the priest would let him smell what beeswax candles smell like and then he became one of us. One of our parishioners who's hurting terribly, and I ask you to please pray for John Kerry, when he was 21 years old, served with the United States Marines in Vietnam. He was sent out with a group of Marines on a reconnaissance patrol. His dear friend who was walking point on that recon patrol stepped on a landmine and the shrapnel blew out John Kerry's eyes. He lost his eyes back in 64 over in Vietnam. He's been blind, of course, ever since. He is suffering terribly. He has an infection that they're trying to get under control, but it's not just physical pain. It's the agonizing over the fact that you can't see and you'll never see again. You may say, well, after all these years, he should have adjusted. But you know what? Post-traumatic stress syndrome affects those who are blind more acutely than those who are not blind, believe it or not. And so one of the things he does, and he told me, he said, Father, if you ever call me around 12 noon, he said, I won't answer the phone and please don't be upset. But he said, that's because I'm listening to EWTN's mass on television. For him, that is the thing that gets him through the day. And it's amazing. A number of years ago, I served the diocese for about 10 years on the formation committee. My job was to help interview and screen men who were showing up and saying, I want to be a Catholic priest. I asked all of the candidates as one of my questions, what brought you here? What influenced you? All of them, all of them told me, it was EWTN. Now, do you think Mother Angelica had any idea when God spoke to her in that garage that she was going to have such an impact on the entire world? The planet Earth, for goodness sake. But you see, that's how God works. Very often we expect God to work in the spectacular, and He does from time to time. Read your Bible and you see plenty of spectacular stories. But more often than not, it's in the mustard seed experiences that the Lord works. So my brothers and sisters, you have a job in the kingdom, each of you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done in the past, you have a job, you have work to do. And I can guarantee you one thing,
no matter who you are or where you come from, the Lord will see that the work gets done.